His client is at the center of one of the most controversial legal fights in the global war on terror. Joining us now is Omar Khadr's lawyer, Dennis Edney. And it's good to have you in that chair. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. Let's do a bit of a, courtesy of the Toronto Star and Amnesty International, just a bit of a fact file here on the life and times of Omar Khadr. Bring everybody up to speed. He was born on the 19th of September, 1986, in Toronto. His father, Ahmed Saeed Khadr, who died in 2003, was suspected of being a financier for al-Qaeda. Omar spent his youth in Canada, in Pakistan, and Afghanistan. In July of 2002, he was captured by U.S. forces in a firefight in Afghanistan and was accused of throwing a grenade responsible for the death of U.S. Special Forces soldier Sergeant Christopher Speer. October 2002, transferred from Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan to Gitmo in Cuba. October 2010, agreed to a plea deal which carried an eight-year prison sentence with one year to be served in the U.S. custody and the remainder in Canada. And he recanted when he returned to Canada. September 2012, finally transferred from Gitmo to Canada, and in May 2015, which I'm sure everybody saw on the evening news, freed on bail with strict living conditions. And that's the life and times of Omar Khadr in very brief detail. Can you tell us about the first time you met him? Yes, I can. It's, uh, it, it's, it remains with me and has remained with me for a long time. I had arrived in Guantanamo Bay, um, had some sense of what Guantanamo was about. I thought he was in the cages where other human beings are locked away, but he wasn't. He was in one of the secret prisons that are in Guantanamo, which we don't talk about. There are three secret prisons, as far as I know, and there may be more. And so I was taken to this big, large concrete building, um, well protected, in the desert, deeply silent inside, a bit gloomy in terms of lighting. And as I'm going into this windowless cell, I'm told that my client, Omar Kader, hasn't spoken to anybody for a number of months. And when I walked in, uh, the cell was freezing. And I later understood that these cells are kept 20, on a 24-hour day basis, cold so that the detainee it never gets to rest. And he's how old at this point? He was 17 at the time. 17 at the time. Maybe 18, but around about there. How, what kind of a rapport did you try to establish with him? Well, when I saw him, um, he, he, looked, he reminded me of a broken bird. He had so much injuries about him. He was chained to a floor. And all my years in Guantanamo Bay, other than going into the courtroom, I'd never seen Omar walk. He was always chained to a floor. Hmm. And so, I, yes, I did try to establish. I spoke at him for about two days, and he didn't respond to me. And it was only on the third day, when I was running out of time, because I was now leaving to go back to Canada, that I pulled out my wallet and started to use up some time. And, it, and I took out my son's hockey card that all us parents have. Your son plays junior hockey in he, Saskatchewan. He does, yes. And, and so here was Duncan's picture with all the stats on the back, and I passed it to Omar. And that, at that point in time, he decided then to speak to me. Why do you think passing him a hockey card accounted for the breakthrough with him? I don't know. I think he was making a judgment of whether I'm just another false adult mm -hmm. trying to manipulate him. Because every adult he knew at that point had basically screwed him over, I guess. Absolutely. Uh, we should say you're in town because Guantanamo's Child is the documentary that has been made about Omar's life, and you figure prominently in that because he's still very much a part of your life today. How so? <laughs> Well, he is, that's, that's true, because he's now living with us. It's a rare experience for a criminal lawyer to take his client into the house. <laughs> You've I, never done this before. I can assure you I've never done it before. Uh, how's that going? It's going very well. My wife should be here to answer that. She loves him at being at home. He's a kind, he's a humor, he has a lot of humor. And he's, he's, um, he's delightful to have him. Delightful. 
I, I, I want to take you back to that day because it was, uh, I'm sure it's so emblazoned in people's minds when for the first time, I guess, ever, he is going to speak publicly to the Canadian media in a big scrum, I guess on your driveway, eh, or just outside your front porch, and the cameras are rolling and he's doing a scrum with media. Uh, what was that like? Well, I should tell you that beforehand, we had a little bit of a tiff with each other because I'd at the courtroom, and I said to him, when you get out, I've got this huge body of media that need to be fed, so you're going to have to say something to them. And he said, no, Dennis, no, 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 no. And so I let it be. Then we get home, and we can't get into our neighborhood because of the media, essentially. And we park the car, go into the house, and then I turn around to him and I said, look, Omar, you have to go out there and say something. I will handle all the hard questions. So he goes out, he answers the questions in a manner that the public has seen and commented about. And when we get back into the house, he turns around to me and said, I thought you were going to help me with the hard questions. <laughs> and you don't need to be helped. You were brilliant. Uh, he did come across as just, what's the word I'm looking for here? He was likable, um, not bitter, not angry, hardly a jihadist, and yet there, of course, will be some people who will look at that and say, hmm, very polished performance, you did a good job prepping your client for the cameras. What's the story? Well, they could believe that as much as they want, but that's not true. Um, I've always been known the, the Omar Kado that the public then saw. In fact, for years, I fought with the Canadian government to allow Omar Kara to be interviewed by the media, just even for one particular visit, so that the public could make their own mind up about the Omar Kara that the Harper propaganda said is a terrorist who committed a heinous crime without any backstory to how he ended up being charged and how he ended up making a, a plea bargain. Well, the backstory is very much a part of Guantanamo's Child, the documentary, which is playing at the Toronto International Film Festival now, or has been playing, I should say. And uh, we're going to show a clip here, and I do want to warn everybody, this is pretty graphic. So if, you don't, if you're squeamish, look away for the next 30 seconds, and then we'll come back and chat. Roll the clip, please. The first time I saw Omar, he was really bad off. Um, he had a really large hole in his chest. Yeah, it was in his chest. And uh, he had shrapnel all over his face. I don't know how he lived through it. He was really blown the f up. A few weeks later, I was moving into his cell, the cell with him. And I saw the stitching all over his body. He looked like you know, an, aut an autopsy had been performed on him while he was alive. How did he recover from those injuries, which look awfully profound? Well, I, first of all, I told you what he looked like when I first saw him. And so he carries those injuries today. But it's miraculous that he survived. What I often say was then he was unconscious for seven days at the, in the Bagram Hospital in Afghanistan. And when he regained consciousness, little did he realize that his troubles had only started. In what respect? Well, from the moment that he was, came consciousness, he was interrogated by an interrogation team under a torturer by the name of Claus. And you saw the picture of Damien Corsetti. Damien Corsetti was a young 22-year-old man who was part of that uh, interrogation team. He was the first person we saw in that clip. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what does he say? He says, we did terrible things to that boy. And he has reached out to Omar through myself and also through Michelle Shepard, uh, seeking forgiveness. Michelle uh, did the book. She's a Toronto Star reporter, Atkinson Fellowship right now, I think, and yes. one of the producers of the, of the motion picture. Uh, through those, um, I guess what some would call enhanced interrogation techniques, which you have called torture, did authorities ever get anything useful out of him? There was nothing to get out of the child. He was a child. But his father, the, 
Omar Khadr, like his brothers and sisters, I presume, speak about four different dialects. And his father used him as an interpreter for a group of Taliban warriors that were in some compound. He abandoned him there. He promised to come and pick Omar up. And he didn't. I have no idea why he didn't, but he didn't. And in the meantime, I think Omar was in the compound, I don't remember how long, but about three weeks or so, maybe a little bit longer, when US soldiers came knocking on the door of the compound, um, asking to, for entry, refused entry, a firefight breaks out, the compound gets blown up, everybody gets killed except Omar Khadr. Mm. Uh, have you come to any conclusions about what you think of Omar's father? You know, I, we did, <clears throat> in our first um, Supreme Court Canada challenge, we, we filed a huge affidavit. And in that huge affidavit, not only did I demonstrate how he had been tortured and abused, but I also dealt with the family, particularly the father. And people I spoke to who had hired him thought highly of him. I, there was no hard evidence ever provided to me to say that he was a um, terrible man, he was a terrorist, etc. What I saw him was he was someone who was a mediator in a, in a, in a, in a land that was full of booby traps. But even Omar says in the documentary he has unresolved issues around his father, right? I, absolutely, because I have spoken to him over the years. I, what I said to him was, you know, the only thing I have against your father was he abandoned you. I'm a father, and I wouldn't do that to my children. And so Omar quite properly says, you know, there are many questions I'd like to ask him. I didn't, we, haven't, we don't know what those questions are, but I'm sure one of them was, why did you put me in harm's way? Speaking of questions uh, that go back, why did you take his case in the first place? I, it's, I've been asked that recently, and I'm not, not sure how I can answer that. Um, I had been reading about Guantanamo Bay, I'm a lawyer. As a lawyer, I would say we're all committed to justice. If we're not there just to earn money, we're there also because we have this title as a lawyer. We're, we're there to do good work. And it offended me. And I couldn't believe that there was a, um, a child in this hellhole called Guantanamo Bay. And so out of, out of some nivet, I decided to see what I could do to assist him. You did not imagine, I imagine, that this would take more than a, de a decade of your life. <laughs> I, you know, I was so naive. Uh, I had no idea that I, what I was doing. I recall that first visit with Omar when I left him, and I said to him, you know, I'm, I'll be back. And he said to me, everybody leaves me. Uh, what is to that effect? And I in a bravado type of way, I said, I won't leave you. And there are many times, I have to tell you, that I wanted to leave and walk away. I had no idea of the challenges I would face or the length of time to be involved. You glad you stuck around? Absolutely. He eventually pleads guilty and receives an eight-year sentence. And I wonder if you could help us understand what went into that decision. Well, you have to understand the trial. But, you know, my mother at times, as I grew up, would accuse me of, of um, not behaving well. She would say things like, you should be ashamed of yourself. Well, she'll have to tell you what it was I did that, that made, me, made her ashamed of me. But I've never been ashamed of being a lawyer, at least until I participated in that fictional trial called Guantanamo Bay. Omar had no witnesses called on his behalf, not allowed in, even though I'd spent a whole summer at uh, getting together with a whole list of witnesses. Torture evidence was allowed in. A hand-picked jury, where, but six of, them were all from the, six of them were from the same office. Um, a judge who didn't know the law. It, it was just a mockery. And, and so I realized at some point that Omar Carter was never going to get out. Because notwithstanding the fact that had the jury agreed that he was innocent, which would be an impossibility with, that, with the way it was set up, 
Um, indefinite detention was still on the table. The, the American government still was sticking to the um, right to keep him in Guantanamo indefinitely. So find, find an agreement, find a, a compromise, and get him out of there. Well, <clears throat> contrary to people's opinions, the Americans wanted Omar Khadr out. And they wanted him out probably a couple of years earlier. And it took, and the Canadian government was not responding to overtures. It took Hillary Clinton to step up and face Prime Minister Harper, who had to really respond to her then, couldn't ignore. And what happened, as you know, um, he was given an eight-year sentence with one year to send to serve back in, in Guantanamo. But the Canadian government didn't carry through with his agreement. It took two years before, Rome, before, they, before they agreed to take Omar back. And they only agreed to take him back because the Americans put him on a plane and flew, flew him back here. Now that he's living with you in Edmonton, what is he allowed to? What is he not allowed to do? He's generally allowed to do anything. He's got a curfew. And the curfew is from, at, um, from 10 o'clock in the morning to 6 in the morning. 10 o'clock and even to 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, and so we've asked to change that curfew before the court, and the court will rule on Friday, and I'm, I have no difficulty in suggesting that will happen. Why? Because he's going to a night class at, at Nate College in Edmonton that finishes at 10. So in order for him to fulfill his commitments, he needs to extend that time. And he's wearing a leg uh, yeah, tracker? an electronic bracelet that, that's quite embarrassing for him. It, because it, it goes off all the time, and, and uh, it's embarrassing for him. And then I have the police call me and say, is he there? Yeah, he's there. Okay, fine. <laughs> and so I hope that the, the court will rule that that comes off. How does, we talked a bit about his father earlier, but of course there are other members of Omar's family who are still in the picture. How does he feel about potentially seeing any of them right now? I think it's important that he sees his family. I think it's important for anybody to come to terms with the family. I have spoken to him about his family. And when I'm talking about his family, I am well aware that years ago, his mother and his sister Zainab stated, said some of the most stupid things that alienated them from the Canadian public, but harmed their, their son. And when I would go into court in Toronto and Superior Court on behalf of Omar Khadr, I would have to deal with the fact that they would make a little bit of fuss, focus on themselves in, in the course of whatever application I was made. And so I, I, I let Omar know that. But Omar should be allowed to love his family. He has told the public exactly how he feels. He said in a brilliant way, and you'll see it in the movie, my experience in Guantanamo didn't change me. And if that doesn't change me, my family won't change me. I've had all other kinds of influences that are part of my growing up. Mm. Guantanamo's Child is the name of the motion picture. Dennis Edney, it's awfully good of you to visit us here at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.